Angelica Harris narrates I was running behind schedule. I had flown in directly from Washington, D.C., leaving early in the morning, and arrived in Conrad, M.T. in the mid-morning. I called a cab and it took me to the church, which was completely filled. It was expected, of course, since Joe Harris was always the most well-liked man in town and everyone wanted to see him off on his final journey. I managed to find a spot in the back of the church. It was standing room only. Some older people recognized me and gave me a silent nod. The service had already started and I didn't want to disturb anyone by trying to make my way to the front pew. A couple to the side of the last pew moved closer together to let me stand next to them so I could see Joe's coffin from where I was standing. The tall, strong man, with a dark tan and handsome features, his black hair neatly cut, looked splendid in his dark blue dress uniform as a full colonel in the USAAF. He carried his hat and a single sheet of paper up to the church pulpit. He placed them on the slope and looked up at the congregation for the first time. His eyes appeared sad and teary, but he stood tall and straight, cleared his throat, and began speaking in a clear, well-spoken voice. I am going to disregard the advice my father Joe gave me on the day of my flight school graduation. He said, Never volunteer for anything, son, and you'll do just fine well. No one was going to beat me to the chance of coming up here and sharing with all of you how much I love the amazing man whose life we are celebrating today, my dear father Joe Harris. All of you gathered here today to bid your final farewell to Joe knew him well. Most of you probably remember me too. But I've been so occupied these past 10 years or so that I haven't been able to make many visits to see my father at the farm. I would only come by on special occasions and holidays before flying off again. My father encouraged me to fly. He took me up in his crop duster before I could even walk, maybe even before I could talk. He inspired me to pursue a career in flying, and now I'm honored to be a part of the U.S. space program. As I speak, my fellow officers are preparing for the monumental adventure of flying to and landing on the moon for the first time. It fills me with pride to know that the first humans to walk on the moon will be Americans, but this achievement is for all of mankind. Yet, even this momentous event, it pales in comparison to the loss that humanity feels with the passing of the man we are here to say our final goodbyes to. Joseph William Harris was born far away from us here in Conrad, Montana. He came from another small town called Sittingbourne in Kent, England. He was born in 1887. When he was 10 years old, he came here with our beloved Granny Harris and his sister after his father passed away in a quarry accident. Granny's brother already owned a farm here in Pondera County, and my great-uncle paid for their trip across the sea in train fare so they could prosper here. Joe was an intelligent boy in school. He earned a spot in college and pursued a degree in agriculture. He later became an electrician and his uncle and cousins worked the farm. But Joe was independent and didn't want to be just an ordinary farmhand. He wanted to build his own business. He became a U.S. citizen in 1906 but he still had ties to the old country of his birth. When the war broke out in Europe in 1914, Papa drove across the border to Calgary and joined the Canadian Infantry. He signed up on a short attestation form, agreeing to serve for the duration of the war that was supposed to end all wars. It was a shock for Granny and even more devastating for his fiancée, who was then Marybeth Johansson, a vice principal at the high school. Papa once told me that when he talked about the past, he had no regrets. He did his duty. He was considered an exceptional candidate by the Canadian Army Recruiting Office because he had two college degrees. By April 1915, he was in the Flanders trenches as a second lieutenant. He never spoke about those times to us children. I think he lost many friends in those dreadful trenches. In 1916, Papa transferred to the Royal Air Corps. He received training in Egypt and flew various airplanes. This led to reconnaissance missions and sorties back in France. He would talk about those times all the time. He was happiest when he was up in the air. He encountered two crashes, managing to bring his plane down safely without harming himself. But the third time, in 1917, just weeks after the U.S. joined the war against Germany, his plane was shot down. He lost his right leg below the knee in the accident. After recovering in an English hospital, he was sent back home to Montana early in 1918. So there was Captain Joe Harris, DFC, DCM, at the age of 31, 
with both his cousins killed in the war in France and his uncle struggling to run the farm alone. Papa had no choice but to give up his dreams of building things and take over the farm, working alongside his uncle, especially after his aunt passed away from the flu that year. His fiancée, Marybeth Johansson, had waited for him to return from the war but decided, after seeing his injuries, to marry Ted Chambers, the manager of the hardware store. Papa found horseback riding uncomfortable with only one leg, and he couldn't drive the truck or the tractor on the farm, so he bought a motorcycle with a sidecar. It was more comfortable and allowed him to be independent, which was always important to him. His uncle passed away in 1929 after a sudden illness, without leaving a will. Papa had to hire help for the farm, but he didn't have money to pay them until the estate was settled and the farm was left to him and Granny Harris as the only surviving relatives. It was in early 1930 that he met my mother, Angelica D'Angelo, when she was looking for work. I asked Mama about how they met. She had hitchhiked to Conrad to visit her sister, but Aunt Connie had already returned to Chicago. Mama was a widow, married to an Italian immigrant named Yanni Diani Di Angelo, who had left to find work in 1929 and never came back. She later discovered that he was riding along with some cousins, acting as a guard during a bootlegging operation from Canada, which went awry. They were most likely shot and killed during a shootout with rival smugglers or the police. Mama, heavily pregnant with me, left Chicago after being unable to pay rent to find her cousin Connie, who had moved to Seattle. But Conrad was as far as she could go. She was a city girl in a small town. The nurse here in Conrad informed her that Papa was looking for farm workers and suggested that she wait in the general store, keeping an eye out for his motorcycle and sidecar. Mama didn't have any money, so she decided to wait outside the warm store, standing by the snow and wind. When she saw Joe pull up, limping towards the steps, and looked into his clear blue eyes, she fainted as I stood proudly at the back of the crowded church, listening to my son, memories flooded back of those days when I first arrived in this town, and met Joe Harris. The first Friday in 1930, Angelica D.I. Angelo narrating, I shivered, as I waited outside the general store at the north end of Main Street in the chilly town of Conrad, Montana. I felt dizzy as I pulled my thin jacket tightly around my neck and leaned against the wooden wall of the store. I would have given anything to wait inside the warm shop or buy a cup of coffee and a sweet pastry, but I had no money, not a single cent. I tried to think back to when I last ate something. It was just before I was attacked and robbed of my belongings and money at a truck stop further back along the road, although I had no idea where exactly. I felt fortunate in a way. If I hadn't been nearly eight months pregnant, the assault could have been worse. The men who attacked me said they would have done something worse if I hadn't been a heavily pregnant African-American woman. The way they spat out the word colored filled with hatred and cruelty struck me deeper than the blows that split my lip and blackened my eye. The nurse at the free hospital in Conrad, a kind Native American woman, patched me up and checked on the health of the baby. She assured me that the baby was doing well. Make sure to come see me next week, honey, she said. I replied, feeling uncertain. I can't say for sure where I'll be next week. I was on my way to stay with my cousin Connie, who moved to Seattle a couple years ago. But when I arrived at her address, I learned that Connie had lost her job and had no prospects there. She had gone back to Chicago just a few days earlier. I had traveled from Chicago two weeks ago and had already used up most of my remaining money by then. I took the train part of the way, but I couldn't afford to go any further. I mostly walked and hitchhiked. On my last ride with two white farmhands, an older man and a younger one, they assaulted and robbed me, leaving me behind at the next truck stop without any money and with my cardboard suitcase containing all my belongings taken from me. They even stole my coat. If I want to stay here, I need to find work. But it's tough to find work looking like this, I told Nurse Annie, trying to keep my spirits up and my tears at bay. And it will be even harder in a month when the baby arrives. What kind of work did you do before? Hanshi asked. I used to work as a ledger clerk in a bank before I got married. There's only one bank left open in Conrad now, Han, and they haven't been doing well since last year's crash. Can you cook and clean, Han? Well, household work, yeah, I guess. Tell you what, Han, it's Friday, the first Friday in January. You go wait by the general store at the north end of this street and look out for a man on a motorcycle and sidecar. 
He's looking for someone to live in and do chores for a few weeks, maybe even a couple of months. His Massachusetts had a fall and sprained her ankle last week. He always does his main grocery shop for dry and tinned goods on the first Friday of the month, so I walked along that snowy main street as directed until I got to the store. The clock inside the store, that I could see from outside, said it was seven minutes past nine. The nurse had said that this Mr. Harris, the man with the motorbike and sidecar, would be along between nine and ten. I just hoped I hadn't missed him, either going in or coming out. I didn't know what I would do if he had already taken someone on or didn't like the look of me, and with the baby's arrival so close. I didn't go into the store to ask about Mr. Harris. I knew how terrible I must look. The nurse, Annie Gray Feather, had showed me my cut face and bruised eye, which was yellow under my brown skin, in the mirror. I leaned deeper into the wooden wall of the store under a short veranda, trying to shelter from the weather. I folded my arms into my chest above my bump, with my bare gloveless hands clenched under my armpits, locked my knees and closed my eyes for just a minute. I awoke on my feet with a start. I heard the noisy motorbike like a muffled hammer banging on metal a while before I actually saw it. The snow was falling even more heavily now, with big and soft flakes, and somehow I felt a little warmer. Either that, or I was so cold I couldn't feel the cold anymore. Even the wind had died, and the thick full flakes kissed the ground around the store, settling thick and even on the road. The sky was full of gray clouds, not a patch of blue anywhere. Although it was still the morning, it was almost as dark as night, the snow glistening in the glow from the electric lights from the store windows. The bike slowed and turned, parking in front of the store, by the steps leading up to the sidewalk. The rider wore a long leather coat, hat and goggles, his front completely covered in snow. Sudden silence reigned as the noisy engine cut out and he slowly climbed down. Because of the sidecar, he didn't need to pull the bike onto its stand. Then he carefully made his way over old frozen ruts and fresh snow until he reached the steps and rail up to the wooden sidewalk. He was tall, I noticed, very thin and walked with a pronounced limp, favoring his right leg. Then he removed his goggles and shook off the snow into the street. He climbed the five steps one at a time, left foot first and dragging his right after, then leading with his left again. When he reached the top, he lifted his face, seeing me for the first time in the shadows, he was lit up with the warm light from the store. He had the clearest, most startling blue eyes I'd ever seen on a man. It was how I imagined a clear mountain pool would look. I stepped forward, but I was stiff and my legs felt as wobbly as jello, Mr. Harris. Excuse me, but Nurse Annie said. Then I felt everything slip away from me and I crumbled to the ground. The last thing I heard was an English accent saying, oh my. When I awoke, I was in a warm bed the first I'd slept in for over two weeks. The starched linen sheets felt smooth and smelled fresh and clean. It was dark in the room, other than the flickering glow from a fire grate in the wall to the right of the bed. I was lying on one side of a huge double bed. Feeling the other side with my hand, I assured myself I was alone. I lifted my head an inch or two and looked around. All the corners of the room were in shadow. The only light came from the fire, but it was quiet, just the odd crackle from the burning logs. So it seemed like I was alone in the room, with no idea at all where I was. I laid my head back into the pillows again, looking up the wall behind me, where I could make out a crucifix was hung above the bed. I couldn't just lay there, I needed to know where I was, so sat up again stiffly. The first thing I noticed was that my clothing had been removed completely, and I was wearing nothing but a cotton nightshirt. A couple of extra pillows were on the bed beside me, and I tried to pull one behind me for more comfort sitting up, but my shoulder ached and I winced. I heard a knock on the door at the end of the room and the tall, thin man with the blue eyes came in, carrying a tray, with a steaming cup on it. I recalled asking him earlier if his name was Mr. Harris, and if so, I was supposed to see him about a job for a few weeks, while his mother was incapacitated. Before I could say anything, he spoke first, in that same English accent. Hello, he said. How are you feeling, ear? my shoulders sore? And I'm a bit woozy. I've got a headache too well. That's about right, Ma, I am, he said. You cracked your head as you fell, and Ma said you may have a bruise on your shoulder that you fell on. Are you Mr. Harris, I am? Most assuredly, Ma, I am, he replied. Did you undress me and put me in bed, Mr. Harris, or your Ma? 
Ma's in a wheelchair at the moment. Ma am, so I undressed you, put on your nightdress, and carried you up here. But don't worry, I had my eyes closed the whole time. Following Ma's directions, he smiled. I might have peeked to get my bearings, but only for a second at most. Ma am. I didn't know what to say to that. He had a nice smile and what I had supposed it had once been a handsome face, but by the light from the fire, I could see now that he had terrible scars on his left temple and cheek, and the top of his left ear was missing. I had only seen him from his right side before, outside the store. Sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you, Ma I am, and I never saw anything, honestly. I have this habit of trying to be funny and failing more often than otherwise. Ma finds my sense of humor, wearing, at best sometimes, and she's supposed to be my supportive mother. He set the tray down on the bedside table and leaned across me to grab the extra pillows. He smelled sweet, I thought, the soft earthiness of meadow hay alongside the sharp scent of fresh soap. I squirmed wondering, with some apprehension, how I smelled. I didn't want to upset myself any more than how I felt already by breathing in too deeply. I had tried to scrub myself clean back at that truck stop after I had been attacked, but the water was cold and the soap hard and almost insoluble. My traveling clothes hadn't been washed in two weeks. I was all too aware and hadn't any underwear to change into for the last three days, and all my other clothes had been stolen by my attackers. He eased me up firmly, gently, and propped me up with the pillows. Then he sat on the edge of the bed and passed me the cup, full of hot, sweet, and creamy milk. I'm Joe Harris, Mrs. D'Angelo. I fetched Nurse Carol to see you during yesterday afternoon. She looked you over, although you were out like a light. She said you were just exhausted and malnourished. Rest assured your baby's fine. And I'm under orders to collect Nurse Carol or Annie just as soon as your time comes. Oh, I can't possibly stay here, Mr. Harris. I was just hoping you had some day work. Nonsense, there's no need to go. In fact, you can't actually leave now. It is snowing like crazy at the moment. Where are you lodging? I can go on the bike and get your stuff if I'm quick before we get cut off by the drifts. I don't have anywhere, Mr. Harris Joe. Please ear Joe. I arrived here yesterday, after finding my sisters moved back to Chicago on Monday, and I had my suitcase stolen on Wednesday, hence my bruises. Well, in that case, you can stay here until you are well. But nothing. Nah, am I need to find work. I have no money. There's work in our farm dairy here when you're up and well, and Ma needs help around the house too. She busted her ankle a couple of weeks ago and isn't too mobile at the moment. Now, drink up that hot milk there's a warm robe here to wear. When you're ready, come downstairs into the kitchen for breakfast. When did you last eat Wednesday? I think, well, it's Saturday morning. You need to keep you and that baby well fed. The nurse was very insistent on that. Now, do you need a hand getting out of bed, or can you manage... Ma, am I think I can manage, I said, and I think if you want me to call you Joe, you should call me Angelica or Angie Well. Try and get up, Angel. I'll hold the robe open for you. I found that I had virtually no strength in my arm, and he had to help me get down from the high cast iron bed. I also had to lean on him as he helped me down the stairs. The woman of the house, that I later came to regard fondly as Granny Harris, was in the kitchen, a big heavy woman, sitting at the table in her wheelchair. She made me welcome and laughed all the while as Joe kept feeding me French toast, bacon, eggs, pancakes, and more toast, in glasses of fresh milk and a cup of tea. Ashamed to admit it, even at my age, but I sat there and ate like a pig until at last my appetite was satisfied and Joe couldn't force another single morsel on me. So what brought you to Conrad, Granny Harris asked me. My husband was killed last year in Canada. I said, Yanni told me he was looking for laboring work in Canada but he had lied to me. His sister-in-law came around after he had been gone a week and told me that he was with his brother, three cousins, and a drifter, and they were attempting to smuggle barrels of whiskey and gin into the U.S. from Canada, only they ran into a rival gang of smugglers and in the shootout. All but the drifter were killed, shot dead and their truck and goods taken. My sister-in-law and her widowed cousins helped me out with food and the rent for a little while but they had lost their menfolk and source of income too. My company laid me off about the same time I heard Johnny was dead. The money dried up and I couldn't make the rent anymore. Oh, you poor thing, Mrs. Harris said sympathetically. I wrote to my cousin Connie a month ago, and she said to come out to Seattle where there was plenty of work in my field. 
but it took me two weeks to get there, partly by train, partly hitchhiking, and mostly walking. When I arrived at her address in Seattle, I found out that she had lost her job a couple of weeks ago when her company went out of business. She probably wrote me, but I had already left on my journey. I didn't know anyone there, so I had to turn back. And this is as far as I got after I was attacked and lost all of my money and belongings. What kind of work did you used to do? Dear Granny Harris asked. I worked as a ledger clerk in a bank in Chicago for six years, but they started laying off staff last year, and when they found out I was pregnant, they fired me. Maybe you could help us out here by looking at Joe's farm books. His uncle, my brother, passed away last year, and he used to handle the tax returns for the farm and our personal taxes. Joe's been trying his best, but he can never get the figures to balance correctly. Yeah, sure, I can take a look, I said, happy to help. I was just feeling really sleepy after all that food. Granny Harris could see how tired I was. Hey, Joe, sweetheart, make sure Angelica gets back to bed for a few more hours. She's exhausted, poor thing. Please call me Angie, I said. Everyone does I'd call you Angel, Joe said quietly as he helped me up the stairs. I heard him, even though he said it softly. 1969 Joey Harris continues his eulogy. I asked mom how they met. She was a pregnant widow named Angelica D.I. Angelo, who hitchhiked to Conrad to stay with her sister. But Aunt Connie had already gone back to Chicago. The nurse at the hospital told her that Papa was looking for dairy workers and that he would be coming on his motorcycle and sidecar on Friday. She didn't have any money left, but she insisted on waiting outside in the wind and snow, instead of staying warm in the store. When she saw Joe pull up and limp to the steps, she looked into his eyes and fainted. It's okay, though. She was carrying me inside her, and I turned out just fine. When she woke up, she was in bed at the farm. I was born a couple of weeks later, and mom became Papa's right hand. She had worked in a bank before she married my biological father, and she quickly sorted out the farm's financials. Papa was a smart man, but paperwork was not his strong suit. Mom filled in that gap perfectly. He couldn't afford to hire farm hands, especially since the city dairy had failed and his milk was going to waste. But mom found out that Granny Harris's brother had saved some money in the bank for emergencies. She told him straight, Joe, it's surely pouring on you. Now she arranged a meeting with the local bank that had foreclosed on the dairy. They didn't have any buyers or money left in the accounts to clean up the spoiled milk that was stinking up Main Street. So mom set up a deal for Papa to buy the whole business for just $1. She organized a team to clean up the mess and rest after the dairy by reaching out to old suppliers, customers, and new ones. Soon, the dairy was back in full production, making a lot of money. The same bank had a branch 150 miles away that had also foreclosed on a crop dusting business. They had three planes, spare parts, and several trucks, including a fuel tanker. They asked if Papa, with his flying experience from the war, would be interested in buying the business. Mom drove us to the airfield to inspect everything. Papa bought the company for just a small amount of money. On our second trip, Papa flew one of the planes back while Mom held me in her arms. My first flight in an open aircraft, and I loved it. Papa had already prepared a field near the house to serve as a home airfield, and a new barn was built over the weekend to serve as a hangar. He even brought back old Ernie Peterson, the aircraft engineer who had kept the World War I planes in the air for the past decade. Old Ernie taught me everything mechanical about those planes, and he helped Papa maintain them for many years. I learned how to fly from Papa in those old planes, and even Mom learned to fly too. She would do crop dusting during busy times, in addition to managing the dairy and farm books. Papa, always full of ideas, opened a milk bar in town where all my friends hung out. For a long time, it was the only place in town that sold ice cream and sodas. It was a couple of years later when mom received confirmation that her husband's relatives, who were believed to be bringing trucks full of spirits from Canada to beat the prohibition, had been killed. She was then free to marry Papa, who was still a bachelor in his early 40s, and Papa officially adopted me as his son. Angel recalls memories from April 1936, Angelica Harris. Listening to Joey talk about those old days, I couldn't help but think back to the old dairy and the milk bar that we opened in part of the dairy on Main Street. We made small experimental batches of ice cream at the dairy and needed a place to sell it. The milk and soda bar became a huge success almost immediately and was the go-to spot in town starting from 1932. 
Thinking about Joey and Joe took me back to two events that changed my life in 1936. We used to start work early at the dairy and finish in the afternoon. As the last one to leave the dairy office on a sunny spring morning, I, Angie Harris, locked up and drove my new Ford sedan to the elementary school to pick up my son Joe Jr. We were doing well, working hard of course, but we believed we were building a future for ourselves. I couldn't stop smiling that spring day, but Junior was bursting with excitement from what he had learned at school. He was such a sweet and charming kid, taking after his father Gianni more than me. He didn't notice anything unusual about my extra happiness that day. I loved my job managing the finances of the Conrad Dairy, and I loved my husband Joe Sr. even more. Joey Jr. didn't realize how much joy they both brought me. Joe was still out spraying fertilizer from the air when we arrived back at the farm. Junior had some chores in the barn to take care of before dinner. Granny Harris was setting the table, and Junior took over once she inspected his cleanliness. While Junior was busy, he heard the plane landing on the grass field near the main road. He knew that Papa would safely store the plane and chemicals in the new hangar before coming home. There was running water at the hangar, so Papa could wash up and change clothes, avoiding any chemical contamination in the house. I had changed out of my office clothes but was still dressed more formally than usual in the evening. Junior might have noticed, but the Harris family farm wasn't known for fancy attire. I waited until Joe parked his bike by the farmhouse before I intercepted him in the kitchen, so we could have a quiet moment on the front porch before going inside together. Five minutes later, we both burst back into the kitchen to announce that Junior was going to have a younger sibling later in the year. Seeing all the smiles on my family's faces made me incredibly happy. They were my family, but it had taken some time to get to this point. Joe always joked about being an average Joe, to which I would playfully respond that he was now less than average with his missing leg and ear. But to me, Joe was better than any other man I had ever known. Those few weeks before my baby Joey was born were so special. I got to know Joe really well during that time, and I grew incredibly fond of him. He was so attentive and caring as my due date approached, and I knew he would be there for me when our child was born. In those days, fathers weren't allowed to be present during the birth. It was a women's domain, with only female relatives and the midwife present. But Joe treated Joey as our baby, and they had a beautiful bond that often brought tears to my eyes. Back to when I arrived and was taken in by the Harrises, I was up and about the next day, feeling refreshed after a good night's sleep and a hearty breakfast. I had a lot of energy and I really enjoyed spending time with the Harrises, both the mother and son. I helped out around the house for a few hours each day, and during the first week, I focused on organizing Joe's farm records and receipts from the past couple of years. His books were not as difficult as he thought, but there were some missing details like cash paid for fuel and general petty cash expenses. Granny Harris also contributed to the confusion with mixed personal receipts. Many customers of the farm were not paying invoices or only paying partial amounts, so it was a challenge to determine which bills were settled and which were still outstanding. Joe had difficulty collecting debts because he was too kind-hearted to take the necessary steps to ensure timely payment. Unlike Joe, I was not as lenient when it came to chasing overdue payments. We started seeing payments coming in without having to resort to legal action. Most customers felt embarrassed once we pointed out what they owed, and the more troublesome ones were forced to find another business to trade with or simply pay up in advance. Of course, there were a few customers who were unable to settle for years, but we couldn't let people go hungry. Eventually, everyone managed to get by thanks to the kindness of our community. From the moment I arrived, the Harris family treated me as part of their own. They never showed any prejudice based on skin color, unlike some people in the countryside. Since I am of mixed race, with a lighter complexion due to my grandmother, I was grateful that race was never an issue while working with the Harrises and interacting with the customers in Conrad. The surrounding area was mainly inhabited by white and Native American people. When we hired workers, about a quarter of them were Native American, and Joe made it clear that he would not tolerate any form of racism towards them. He treated everyone equally, and the Native American workers were happy to be a part of our team. They held Joe in high esteem for being a fair and honest employer. I believe they admired him for never allowing his disability to hinder him from pursuing what he wanted. He always found a way to work around it. During a meeting with the bank to discuss our lines of credit and transfer balances to investment accounts, 
we made an unexpected discovery. It turned out that the farm business already had investment accounts that Joe's uncle had set up and Joe was unaware of. The money in those accounts, along with the accrued interest, put us in a position to hire more laborers for the farm and make it even more profitable. To our surprise, the bank manager informed us about a dairy in town that they had foreclosed on and were struggling to sell. They were willing to sell it for a dollar on the condition that the buyer cleared it out immediately. The dairy, located on Main Street across from the bank, was causing the whole area to smell from rotting milk. Without wasting any time, Joe decided to hire the 50 unemployed former dairy workers to clean up the place and bring it back into operation. They started sourcing milk from local farms, selling what they could, and giving a lot away to schools, hospitals, and those in need through the churches. Before we knew it, they had the dairy producing cream, yogurt, and cheese, which they shipped out by train to nearby towns and gradually expanded further. May 1936, Angelica Di Angelo. The second event that occurred in the spring of 1936 also revolved around the dairy. I was reconciling the April accounts in preparation for the upcoming board meeting on Monday. We had kept the dairy as a separate business from the farm and crop dusting companies so that it could be sold more easily if necessary. Anything we made above a dollar plus cleanup costs was considered pure profit. However, the dairy was doing so well, especially with the new milk bar, that we decided to continue operating it. The board consisted of Joe, Granny Harris, and myself as the secretary. While working, I received a call on the telephone in my office. It was Suzanne from reception informing me that I had a visitor. Since I wasn't expecting anyone, I asked her who it was. She replied, E.M. Mr. D.I. Angelo is here to see you. The only D.I. Angelo I knew was my late husband Gianni, who I believed was killed in 1929 in Canada, along with his only brother by rival bootleggers. I instructed Suzanne to send him up to my office. As I stood up to greet him at the doorway, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was Gianni, as if he had returned from the dead. I pulled him into the office, and before I could react, he kissed me on the cheek. It felt as passionate as all the kisses I remembered, and in that moment, the past six years seemed to disappear, and I felt young again, still married to this man. Eventually, he stopped hugging me, and I managed to catch my breath. What happened to you, Johnny? Your sister-in-law told me you and Giorgio were shot dead in Canada. We were all shot in a double cross by a rival group who thought we were intruding on their business, including my brother, cousins, and my brother's friend, Alberto Bianchi, who was a drifter from the East. They were all killed, and I was left critically injured, believed to be dead. I had a criminal record from before we got married, and I would have faced a long prison sentence, so I switched identities with Alberto. Instead of 20 years, I received a five-year sentence. So when did you get released, I asked. Two years ago, two years ago. Why didn't you try to find me? I'm here now, aren't I? He responded. I had no idea where you were until your cousin Connie came to my club last week. Connie? My Connie, yes, Connie herself. She came with a group of her co-workers, all looking stunning. So you own a club now. Is that where you work? It's my nightclub. I'm in charge of everything. It's doing really well. I even have a nice apartment above it. Connie told me about our son, Joey, so I prepared the second bedroom for him. How did you manage to own a nightclub? You were in prison, right? Yes, but I stayed out of trouble and told the police that I was just an unemployed laborer who knew nothing about any criminal organization. So when I was released, I gained the trust of the bosses and got a great job managing a speakeasy that became incredibly profitable once prohibition ended. I did so well that the organization allowed me to buy a 5050 partnership. Now, we're on top of the world, sweetheart. So when Connie told me where you were, I thought, fantastic, I'll come and bring you and our child home. You'll love it, babe. We're set for life and going places. But everyone believed you were dead. I've built a life here and Joey has just started school. He loves it here in the countryside. That's all he's ever known. And Johnny, I'm, I'm married. Of course you are. You're married to me. And your current husband doesn't really count. Our marriage is the only one that matters in the eyes of God. The marriage you have here in this small town holds no significance. Besides, I want my child back. When can I see him? He's at school. I'll pick him up this afternoon great. 
Maybe we can have lunch together and explore the town. Or I can show you my hotel room I have to work, Johnny Johnny Anjay. Remember, I go by Johnny now. Can't we pick up the kid now and play catch in the park? No, he's in school. He can't just leave whenever he wants. And I can't either. I have to finish the monthly financial reports. I understand business is important. What about lunch? You need to eat and we need to catch up. I usually bring my lunch and work through it so I can pick up Joey, Joey, Joey. You didn't name our firstborn after me. No, I thought you were dead, Johnny. I named our baby Joseph Yanni Mario D'Angelo. But I have to tell you, I remarried, and my husband adopted Joey. He is now Joseph Yanni Mario Harris. Joey considers Joe his dad, and Joe sees him as his son. Well, you're not really married to this other guy. I married you first, in a church before God and everything, but Johnny, there was a death certificate. Canadian authorities declared you dead. You could have found a way to let me know. I was in prison, living a different life. All incoming and outgoing letters were monitored. Plus, I had no idea where you went. I thought you would wait for me in Chicago, but it's not a problem. I'm back now. I am successful. Doing well enough that you will never have to work in an office again. I'll come back in three hours and we'll go pick up our child. I couldn't focus on the financial reports anymore. The thought of my husband returning from the dead consumed my mind. I loved Joe, he was an amazing husband. But Gianni, or Johnny as he wanted to be called, was my first love. We had known each other for a long time, and he had always been my hero. He fought for me when we were young, protecting me from bullies. Life was never easy for a girl like me, who was half-caste Negro, even with my lighter skin. Italians at the time only married Italians, so Yanni would always find himself in fights defending my honor. I loved him deeply, and now that he was back, I had to admit that my life in this small town was over. I could tell that my Joey was not happy with Johnny. As soon as we picked him up from school, instead of letting me handle it, Yanni, sorry Johnny, jumped straight in and told Joey he was his real father, and that from now on he'd be known as Johnny Jr. and live in the big city. Joey tried to hide behind me, insisting that he already had a daddy, the only daddy he knew, and was Joey or Joey Jr., not any other mean name that he didn't want. He was clearly frightened but defiant. For a moment I thought, he's more Joe's son than he could ever be Johnny's. Even the set of his chin, even though it was an exact match of Gianni's, was jutted out like Joe when he refused to budge an inch. Like when I tried to stop trading with the farmer's co-op because they were so far in debt, a couple of years ago, and he said they'd pay up eventually provided we didn't hurt them. And they did, and their smiles were still so intact that they turned into one of our best customers with the sweetest dairy milk. You could taste the milk bar was stocked almost exclusively with their cream and buttermilk. Look, sweetheart, I said to Joey, crouching down to his level, we'll have a long train ride into the city, you'll have a nice room of your own, and if you don't like it, I can bring you back here to stay. Would that be all right? While Johnny, or Johnny, as he now preferred to be known, went back to the hotel he'd stayed at for a couple of nights, to pack and meet us at the station, I went to pick up clothes and stuff for Joey and me. When we got back to the Harris farm, Joe was still out on the farm working. I packed a small suitcase with a couple of changes of clothing for Junior and me, told Granny Harris we were heading for the station as my husband had come for me. 1969 Joey Harris concludes his eulogy with old Ernie keeping three crop dusters in the air. It was sure as eggs were eggs that I would fly with Papa as soon as I could sit upright on a sack of cornmeal so I could see out of the cockpit. So, it didn't take long before I was doing the flying while Papa operated the sprayer from the passenger seat. Mama, being the driving force she was in the family, was also solo flying planes. She learned to fly solo while I was still in diapers, and she was a fine and careful flyer. Yes, sir. She had old Ernie fixing everything that was slightly under regulation. As soon as the war against Japan was declared, followed by the declaration of war against Germany, Papa wanted to volunteer for the Air Force. He was 55, but told the recruiting sergeant he was 42 and had been a captain in the British RFC. I think they realized he had lied about his age, but they put him on delivering new aircraft from factory to airfields all over the country for training or flew them close to the ports that were sending them overseas for the invasion of Europe, D-Day. He was often gone from home for weeks at a time. 
but never happier than when he was in the air. He hardly ever spoke about his First World War, but you couldn't stop him talking about the Second. I was only 12 when the war started, but you grow up real quick in wartime. Mama had also joined up too, also volunteering to deliver airplanes from the factory to wherever they had to go. They both trained on a variety of aircraft from fighters to bombers and spent the next couple of years crisscrossing the country, hardly ever meeting. Then in 1944, Papa flew bombers over the Atlantic in preparation for the D-Day invasion of Europe. This was the first time back in his old country for 18 years. All through his life he used to tell us kids, and anyone else who was listening or tried to heap praise on him, that he was just an average Joe doing his duty to the best he could. Well, we have packed out this church today to say goodbye to a Joe who was son, husband, father, grandfather, colleague, and friend, and to us all he was anything but average. 1969, Angelica Harris narrating, I could see the tears roll down my Joey's cheeks as he finished saying goodbye in front of all our family and friends to the only real father he knew. I felt the tears running down my cheeks too. The woman standing next to me put her arm around me. I knew her, by face if not by name, but she knew me, and she must have known Joe and loved him too. He had just so much to give. Everybody loved average Joe Harris. The coffin was laid on the shoulders of eight sorrowful but proud men. I knew them all well. Three of them were my children. When they drew near, Joey spotted me at the back of the church. Mama, you made it. Yes, they tried to delay us all night, but we got the Farm Reform Act through the House and onto the Senate last night, and I flew up early this morning. I fell in behind the coffin, with our daughters Jelly Fox and Molly Andrews, and we walked out to the Harris family plot, where Joe's mother and uncle lay along with memorials to Joe's brave cousins, lost in France while keeping the world free from oppressive rule. Joe was a justice of the peace and a local councilman, but he wasn't interested in politics, he was a working farmer, but he was interested in farmers' rights in Washington, so he urged me to serve in the House of Representatives for the state of Montana, which I did from 1969 to 1971, the second woman and the first person of color from my state to do so. I almost left Conrad with Johnny and without Joey back in 1936. Joey flatly refused to go. At the station, my first husband, Johnny Bianchi, was disappointed about leaving Joey behind. Behind. As soon as Joe reached the farmhouse, and between them, Joey and Granny Harris explained to him how I'd left with my first husband and how it came about that he was still alive, Joe ran to his bike and rode as fast as he could to the railway station. Why the station? Johnny, the businessman and club owner from Chicago, was afraid of flying. Joe had me comfortably flying solo in all three of our planes, all very different, within six months of bringing them home. Angel. Joe said at the station, as we stood there, the three of us, please don't break up our family. I know you told mom that your former criminal husband is now legit. But do you really know this man? Do you remember what life was like when you were his wife and how your life is now? Do you realize how many people are relying on you for their jobs, at the dairy, the farm, the small businesses and tradesmen in this town? Do you realize how much I would miss you? Granny would miss you and Joey if he joined you, and how you going without him would tear Joey apart. And what about the baby? The baby. In all the excitement, I'd forgotten the baby, our baby Joe's baby inside me, due before Christmas. How could Gianni, Johnny make me forget my baby? Was I mad? I looked at Johnny, clean-shaven, tall, dark and handsome, his black hair slick, in his smart double-breasted suit, sharp down to his shiny shoes. The fashionable tie complemented his sharp silk shirt, expensive tie pin and matching cufflinks, his shirt cuffs being tugged by his soft, manicured hands as I looked him up and down, every inch the stylish businessman in his mid-thirties. Joe, on the other hand, his sandy-colored hair thinning and uncombed, he was just above average height and wiry build, his worried face scarred and tanned by daily contact with the elements. In his late forties, his work clothes freshly soiled and permanently stained by the toil of his labors. His thick cotton unbuttoned shirt frayed at the collar and cuffs, his work boots scuffed and caked with mud, his hat pulled from his head and crumpled in his calloused hands as he pleaded with me to reconsider. I had kissed his scars nightly, lovingly, thanking him for doing his service for both his countries when they needed him. I was proud of him in company, an honest, decent, modest man, successful because people like him, respected him, trusted him. 
I loved him for caring for me and loving me completely when only a couple of days before I met him I was dismissed. Joe had loved my son as if he was his very own. I loved him because he treated me with respect as an equal, in our businesses, in our home, and in our relationship. I loved him for his dedication to work, making us indispensable to the town. I loved his warm smile and his passion for life. I loved him for loving me as much as I loved him. I did love him. This man who insisted he was so average, and yet was so much more than the sum of his parts. I loved this man who had been the real father to Joey and would be the father of our baby and any other babies to come. I smiled warmly at him, and he smiled back with that lovely smile of his. I turned to Gianni to apologize to him, and I looked at Gianni closely again. The memories which had affected my perception began clearing. His face was no longer handsome, but haughty and sneering, his eyes full of hate for this challenge to his wishes and expectations from this humble farmer. Go back to your farm, old man. Johnny snarled at Joe. Angelic is mine again. She's always been mine, and no hick farmer's gonna take her away from me. When we're settled at home, we'll be back for my son Johnny Jr., and there ain't nothing you can do to stop me if you know what's good for you. With that, he undid his jacket with his left hand, revealing a handgun in a shoulder holster which he reached for with his right hand, after letting go of my arm. No, I shouted at Gianni. In an instant, Joe sprang into action, faster than I had ever seen him move before. It reminded me of how he reacted in the stables, where he had a knack for sensing when a horse was about to kick. He stomped on Yanni's shiny shoe with his left foot, securing Yanni's hand and gun with his strong, weathered hands. Yanni was immobilized, his legs giving out beneath him. While keeping his gaze locked on Johnny, Joe asked if I was okay. I nodded and asked, Are you all right, honey? Yes. I'm fine, he replied, still fixed on my former husband's eyes. I'm so sorry, Joe. I was just confused. I love both of you, but I only loved Gianni as a child. As he grew up, he never really matured, you know. Our marriage was mostly filled with hardships and him cheating on me. But because of you, my love for him was overshadowed by our love. Today, they without you grounding me, I got lost in a fantasy that was never real and could never be. Can you forgive me? Honey, we'll talk about it when we get home. I see that Charlie has called the police. I noticed the station manager in his office, speaking on the phone, and I could even hear the sound of sirens approaching. The police station was only a short two-minute drive away. I later learned that Yanni was charged not only for drawing a concealed weapon, which was permitted in our state, but because the weapon he drew was illegal, with all serial numbers filed off. Witnesses waiting for the 8 o'clock train testified that they believed he intended to use the weapon. During the trial, Yanni's name and history were brought to light. He spent three years in jail in Montana before being extradited to Canada, where he received a 10-year sentence for a shootout in 1929. It took into account his previous convictions. The illegal gun he carried was over 20 years old and had been used in at least 12 unsolved murders in Chicago since 1925. Yanni was released in 1942, but tragically, he was gunned down shortly after returning to Chicago. Joey only saw him once, and Joe and I saw him briefly during Joe's testimony. 1990 Angelica Harris narrating, I rarely think about that day in 1936 anymore. Most of my memories are filled with joy, especially those of my life with Joe, who was a truly exceptional partner. Jelly Angelica Elizabeth Harris was born right before Christmas in 1936. She married Aaron Fox in 1958 and blessed us with three beautiful grandchildren. Molly Mary Ellen Harris followed in 1938. She married Harry Andrews in 1961 and gave us even more joy by bringing four grandchildren into our lives. Bobby G. Robert George Harris lived from 1940 to 2003. He took over the farm and worked as a dairy and arable farmer. Bobby G. was a quiet and kind-hearted man who never married but always had a smile on his face. He was a beloved uncle to all the children in the family. Huey Hugh Brown Harris, born in 1944, took over the dairy. Now, his son Joe runs it. During the war, Joe and I delivered new combat aircraft for as long as we could. We relied on Granny Harris to care for the farm while we flew in the skies, doing our part to aid in the war effort. In 1944, everything changed when Hubie was born. I had to stay home since Granny, who had been a pillar of support for us, was getting older and five children ranging from 12 to newborn would have been too much for her. 
Granny Harris, who was incredibly kind and generous, passed away in 1953. We still miss her every single day. I ventured into politics briefly, focusing on local issues. I only served two years in the House, and I was relieved to leave when my term ended. My biggest regret was having to rush away from Joe's deathbed to participate in a debate and vote in Washington. I missed the first few minutes of his funeral. Our 39 years together were filled with love and happiness, and being rescued by Joe, my real-life hero, who found my lost suitcase, was the best thing that ever happened to me.